Amen. Well, I'll invite you to turn in your Bibles once again to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, as we're continually looking at this throughout this chapter, uh, the childlike faith, or child, the, the coming to Christ like a little child. This whole chapter is, is focused on that as he describes to his disciples uh, how they're to come to him, how they're to be, and what they're to be like. As we sort of looked last week at what was going on, we seen that this is happening at the same time that Peter had been um, really put on the spot about taxes. He, they asked if his master paid taxes, and he said yes. And without hesitation, when he went back, Jesus confronted the whole situation and provided what was needed. But it says at the same time, in verse number 1 of Matthew chapter 8, it says at the same time, the disciples came to him, and they were wondering who was greatest in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Who was going to be greatest there? Aren't you grateful that he, just, he, he used the child to be able to give to them the example that was needed to be great in the kingdom of heaven? What a wonderful, wonderful thing that he gives to us. And we sort of talked about that last week. And this week, I want to look at verse number 3, and well, I'm going to read all, all four verses, but I want to look mostly at verse number 3, and I want to go back through Matthew and, and show how Matthew reveals the gospel, how he reveals the gospel and, and, his, and the gospel of Matthew. It says this right here. It says in verse number 1, it says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be, be converted and become as a little child, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is great in the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, once again, we do come before you as needy people in need of a touch from heaven, in need for our eyes to be open, and Lord, for us to be able to see. And Lord, I pray, God, that you'll help us tonight as we look through your word. Lord, that you would reveal your truths. And Lord, we'll praise you for what you accomplish in our lives. I do humble myself realizing I'm just a man in need of you. And Lord, I pray that you'd have your will above that which I would desire or anybody else. And Lord, we'll praise you for what you accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. He says in verse number three, except you be converted. There, there has to be in the life of, of, of every person that comes into the kingdom a conversion that takes place. The question often is asked, well, what does all this, in, uh, this include? What is included in this conversion? How does it take place? Well, I want to, I want to, I want to show you what Matthew reveals to us in, in, the, in the ideal of this conversion. But I want you to realize that, that these, are just, uh, these are just parts of conversion that are given out. And it doesn't give, it, it doesn't give uh, specifics. It just gives things that are needed. And I want you to see these things that are needed for a person to become uh, into the kingdom of God. And you can see the character of this if you reflect on it as if a child had them. Our child was, was producing these in their life. Now Matthew presents in his gospel, if you, go, if, you'll, if you want to, you can go to chapter number 3. But I'm going to start in chapter number 1 and work my way up t as we go through these, book, uh, these chapters in this book. As we approach chapter number uh, 1, we read of Christ and his genealogy, his birth, the promise, 
that promise coming into contact or into uh, uh, into uh, uh, truth. And I, I, I want you to realize something, okay? Because we don't understand just exactly what this means because we're not Jews. But when a Jew thought of the Messiah, he thought of the King, the Lord, the 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 uh, the Anointed One of God. It wasn't. It wasn't. We, he never. They, they, nobody that was a Jew ever struggled. They gave their life to Christ, whether whether they were making Him Lord of their life or not. It was never a struggle for them when they when they gave their life to Christ that they were that, that they were going to be you know partially surrender or totally surrender, as a Jew, because of the fact of the matter the the Messiah was the one by which they would surrender their lives to, to guide them, direct them, to lead them. And today we struggle with those things. I mean, uh, we 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 talk uh, this morning we talked about lordship salvation. Well, you don't want to talk about that too loud because that, 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 that throws up a flag and says, hey, you know what, you're, on, you're way over yonder. Or you don't want to talk about uh, uh, antinomianism because well, that throws up another flag and you're way over there. So, I mean, so we struggle with, with those things of where does our commitment come into? Where does our, where does our belief fall on? Where does salvation fall on that? But for the Jews, I want you to realize that when they saw who he was and through the lineage that he was the one promise that went all the way back to, to Adam, all the way back to David, that he was the one. I mean, it was, he had the royal right to be. So number, chapter number one, we see the royal rightness of his birth. Then we come to chapter number 2, and we, we read of the homage that is paid to him at birth. The, the, the magi that came, the wise men that came, and they, they, they brought gifts unto him because they wanted to see him that was born king of the Jews. Then, him that was born king of the Jews. Also in chapter number 2, we find out who he is. He is the son of the highest, God in the flesh. Jesus, the one who would save his people. So we know who he is. Gives a clarity of of who this babe that was born. We're introduced to Jesus Christ. Then we come to chapter number 3, and we find in chapter number 3, there's a forerunner that, that comes in, into play. And it's John the Baptist, and what is he preaching? Anybody know what he's preaching? Repentance. He's re- verse number 2, he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now we have the first thing that, that is viewed as needed is entering into the kingdom, and that is repentance. It's sad today that salvation being re, being preached without an, an 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 understanding that repentance is necessary. But yet, Matthew reveals that to enter into the kingdom, you must have what. We just said it. What must we have? Repentance. A turning away. It doesn't take a scholar to figure out that we need repentance. You can simply just read through the Word of God. Now, when you go just a little longer and get to chapter number four, and all of a sudden Jesus comes along to pick up where John's left off. In verse number one, you find. The time that Jesus begins to preach, what's that word again? Repentance. Same message. Jesus didn't change the message. He said, well, you know, John just had, had, almost had it right. No, Jesus preached repentance also. He said, 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the first condition is the word repentance, which means a turning away from sin. Isn't that funny that that salvation starts with a turning away from sin? Later in chapter number 9, you'll find out in verse number 13, Jesus says that we should... That they, they still didn't understand. He said he came to call sinners to what? Repentance. All throughout the Matthew and all throughout the Word of God, you find that word. And it's sad today that, that when we present the gospel, that we don't present the gospel in the form of repentance. And yet... That was what was preached. So we realize that there must be a a turning from our sins. A turning from something to something. We're turning from our sins to God. That's where it all starts. That's where salvation begins. It's a recognizing of, of sin and a desire to turn from it. Can I tell you, if a person has no recognition of their sins, it's very unlikely that they're ever going to want to turn away from it. And if they, if they have no recognition of their sins and they're not willing to turn from it, then it's very unlikely that they'll ever truly be saved no matter what comes out of their mouth. We need to be sorrow or sorry for our sins. And have a desire to turn to repentance. Well, if you'll read just a little further, we come to chapter number five. And in chapter number five, he, he, it opens with and that he opened his mouth and taught them. In verse number two, and then verse number three, he teaches them and he says to them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here's another element that enters into the kingdom realm. Being poor in spirit. It's it's another word that has the sense of unworthiness. This is it, it actually means to beg to be poor in spirit. You're you're not earning your way, you're begging your way. You have no resource. And so you say, I want to turn from my sin. I want to repent. I'm sorry for for my sins. But I'm unworthy to enter in the kingdom. Can you see the beggar's heart that's in that? The poorness of, of recognition that is there. It's coming with nothing in your hand as a beggar. Nothing to give. Nothing to, to be able to barter with. Just begging. When you see this beggar in verse number 6, that this beggar becomes hungry and thirsty. He has got to the place in his, in his sins that, that his desire is that of hunger and thirst in his life, that he, must be fill, that he must be filled. His desire is growing and greater and greater in magnitude, that he must have this salvation. He wants to be filled. He wants to be quenched. But he has no resource on his own to fulfill those desires. He has no resource in his own to be able to be able to turn from his sins. And we see him come as a beggar. And this is the second thing that strikes us strongly in Matthew's gospel. To, to get into the kingdom. That there is a sense of inadequacy. That is entangled with conviction. Of the sins. Of bankruptcy. That is. Revealed in personal character. 
the desire to turn is, from sin is there. The want to enter into the kingdom is there. And there is nothing adequate in their selves to be able to do so. And the third thing that we see that hits our focus is in verse number four. There's mourning. Can I tell you, when someone recognizes their sin and they find that they have no, no way to be able to enter in the kingdom of God on their own, can I tell you, it is a mournful thing to see that you're in a place of destitute of destruction. And in verse number 5, we see meekness. It's in the revelation of, of, of those things happening in a person's life that brings them to a meek and lowly humility. And it's that kind of meekness that you can show mercy to people. Can I tell you, when, when hearts are prepared that, that are in this condition, can I tell you, it's not hard to reveal the mercy of God. It's not hard to bring someone to a place where they can see God's willingness to receive them. It's the kind of mercy that seeks a purity of heart. In verse number 8. It's a kind of meekness that... that that makes a peacemaker out of you. It's the kind of mercy that is willing to, to be persecuted. It's true humility. So if we just read through at face value the, to get into the kingdom of heaven, you must repent to get into the kingdom of heaven. There must be a, 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 a poverty of spirit that is recognized to get into the kingdom of heaven. And there must be a humility that says, I'm nothing and I have nothing in front of me. I have nothing to give. You're not offering to God some great thing. When you come to enter into the kingdom. We read just a little further into chapter number 7. And we find that uh, something else in verse number 21. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. No, now we learn that it, that it's not just talk. It's not just saying it. This is something that, that, that happens deep inside of us. This is something that, 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 is, that is a transformation on the inside. It's more than just saying you want to be in. It's, ain't so, it's not some club that you just join. But he says, but he that doth the will of the Father who's in heaven. That's a, an obedient act that takes place. It, it, it's not just saying it, it is, it is the action of obedience in our life that reveals that submission to God in obedience. So here we find... First of all, there's repentance, a sorrow of sin, and to desire change in our life, a change from what we were. And then out of that comes a sense of unworthiness. Even th though we desire, we're, we're really unworthy. I, I, when, I, when, I was, when I was preparing this, I, I was thinking so much on... on uh, uh, John Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress, as he struggled with his sins and carried them with him in mourning for, for relief from them. Knowing you have nothing, 
no resources. You have no chance of relief. You're bankrupt. You can't do anything. You don't deserve anything. And that feeling of humility before an awesome and wonderful God. And then you learn that you've got to do more than just say that you want it. There's an act of obedience in your heart towards it. Willing to surrender yourself to Him. It's not just saying you want to belong to the Lord. It is not external. It is a deep internal uh, obedience to God, the will of God. And there you have submitted unto the, the Lord and submitted unto His deity. Then you go to chapter 8 and you find something else. In chapter 8 and verse number 19, if you'll remember, a, a, a guy comes along and he says, I want to follow the Lord. I want to follow you, Lord. I want to go where you go. I want to, I want to, I want to be a part of, of your kingdom. And Jesus turns to him and says, Foxes had holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man had not, nowhere to lay his head. There's no provisions. It's a place of sacrifice. Jesus doesn't say when you come to me, hey, listen, I'm going to straighten out your life. Jesus doesn't say to you, hey, when you come to me, I'm going to make sure all your bills are paid. Jesus doesn't say, hey, when you come to me, I'm going to, I'm going to provide everything that, that you want in life. He doesn't do that. And these men come to Jesus and they, they were looking to have the good life. And Jesus said, hey, listen, my road's rough. There's not, the, 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 the animals of the field have places to lay their head. The birds of the air have, have nests to go to. But hey, I don't even got a place to lay my head down. If you're going to follow me, you need to realize that. I believe there's too many times in our life we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we want, we, we, we want Him as our, uh, we want the benefits that He has, but we don't want the sacrifice that comes along with it. In chapter number 8, there, there's another disciple that would come along. And he said, before I leave and go with you, let me, let me go bury my father. Or permit me to bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the, bed, the dead bury their dead. Some people read that and they think, boy, that's awful cruel. Not allowing someone to bury their own family member. How could the Lord ever be that cruel? That's not what he was saying at all. It's not, it's not in the fact that, that the gentleman was at, uh, his father was at home and, and on the sickbed waiting to die. No, his father was still doing good. He was wanting him to wait till he died that he could get the inheritance from his father to be able to go. Can I tell you, God is not waiting for you to get what you want out of the world to turn to him. Salvation isn't that. So if you want to be in the kingdom of heaven, you, it's not something to fool around with. We have to drop everything. All the manners of life. Count the cost and follow him. Jesus said what... Men, is there you that would, would not sit down first before they build a house and count the cost? At least when you start, you're not able to finish. Listen, there's a, there's, there, there, in reality, there is a cost in salvation. 
We don't, we don't realize that. I, I, I mean, we, we, we don't preach that. We don't present that. You read just a little bit further, and you come to chapter number 10. And you struck immediately with verse number 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, I shall confess before my Father who is in heaven. Salvation isn't only an internal thing, but there's an external commitment that has to take place in our life. That we must be willing to express Jesus Christ before others. Can I tell you, it's not just that of the church either, but that of the world. There's that expression that, of whose side we're on. Who we belong to. We're to confess him before men. He is our Lord. He is the one that we follow. He is the one that we'll serve. If we're not willing to do that, he said he will deny us in heaven. I'll deny you. So there is an outward confession that a public uh, presentation, if you would, that takes place with the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you the, the, one of the greatest things that we need to always make sure that we, that we tell people is, listen, when you receive Christ, you need to tell somebody. You need to tell somebody what happened to you. You need to tell everybody you meet what took place. So we've seen in the book of Matthew that, that there's repentance that takes place to enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's a turning from sin and a desire to change in our life. There's a realization of our unworthiness and the, and, 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 uh, the change to enter into the kingdom of God that brings uh, in place a meekness and humility in our life and a willingness to submit in obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what the cost. A willingness to be outwardly confessing who he is. Before men. Then we come to. Verse number 37. 38, 39. Listen to these verses. He that loveth the father or mo uh, mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not up his cross and falleth after me is not worthy of me. And he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life shall find it. How striking is this? That there has to be in your life a total commitment that there's nothing that you have that is more important than Him. Isn't that something? Jesus is looking for total commitment. He doesn't want to share the, 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 the limelight with anybody. He says, that you, if you're not willing to take this cross up and follow him, he says, you're not worthy of him. You come to the point of self-denial, self-sacrifice. It means you say no to everything and, and all the comforts of life. No to your family. No to your inheritance. No to your self-will, to your own desires. You abandon yourself for the Lord Jesus Christ. You are outwardly confessing Him and following Him in your life. And 
You remember the parable that he gave in the kingdom of God where he talked about the, the, the parable of the pearl. In reality, you're selling all that you have to buy that pearl. Selling everything to take that treasure out of the field. Then you come to chapter number 15. And you see there's, a, there's an ingredient in verse number 22. And Jesus is a, approached by a woman in, at Canaan. And, and she doesn't even, he doesn't even recognize her. And she's crying out. And she's saying, have mercy on me, Lord, thou son of David. My, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. And he answers her nothing. Just ignores she's even there. And finally, he turns to her and says, O woman, great is thy faith. Can I tell you that salvation comes with a persevering faith? I, I want you to see this because people don't Start out and fall out of faith. The faith of God perseveres through. That's true salvation. There's not this, I'm in, I'm out, I'm in, I'm out, I'm in, I'm out. Faith is not like that. There's going to be times that, you have, that you're weak in faith. But can I tell you that faith's still going to press through. There's going to be times that your faith may, 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 may waver a little bit. But can I tell you that, that faith that you have is going to be steadfast and it's going to press through. But she keeps on. She keeps up and finally... The Lord received, uh, the, the woman receives of the Lord because of her great faith. The people who enter in the kingdom, the Bible describes them as those that press. They press through the narrow gate. They walk the narrow path. There's a price that they pay. But they're persistent in their confident faith brings them to the place where the sufficientness is in Christ. They can't be distracted for very long if they're extract, distracted at all. They press on. Like the gentleman that kept knocking and the Lord of the house finally responded. They continued to press on. Ma Matthew lays, lays out for us a very clear description of the things that are required to enter into the kingdom. The things that are necessary. There must be repentance. There must be a sense of unworthiness. There must be humility. There must be a willingness of, of submission and obedience to the Lord and confession. There must be self-denial. There must be a, 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 a pressing faith. These are the elements of salvation. And I tell you that none of these things can be produced by the flesh. They'll never last. This is a work of the Holy Spirit. And nothing else can, can accomplish these elements in a person. Jesus said, except you be converted. Can I tell you, the conversion is the greatest thing that takes place in a child of God. Amen. And it makes a difference in your life. I want to, he tells them that they need to have simple childlike faith. 
humbly trusting. I want to close with a poem that someone wrote. I don't know who, who wrote it. I don't think the author's known. But it says this right here. It says, Make me, O Lord, a child again, so tender and frail and small. If self possessing, uh, in self possessing nothing, in thee possessing all. O Savior, make me small once more, that downward I may grow, and in this heart of mine restore the faith of long ago. With thee may I be crucified, no longer I that live. O Savior, crush my sinful pride by grace which pardon gives. Make me, O Lord, a child again, obedient to thy call, in self possessing nothing, in thee possessing all. That's what we need. To possess all in him and surrender in all of ourselves. Well, let's stand together as we pray. I hope that each person here has received Christ. But this is the gospel, our, our salvation according to Matthew. And oh, how we need it in our lives. Need these, these marks that he reveals. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray God that you'll help us as we continue to study to be able to grow more and more and closer to thee. Lord, we'll praise you for all that you do. Open our eyes to be able to see. Move on our hearts to be committed to thee. And we'll praise you for your grace and mercy. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Shake hands with one another. You're free to go.